This is not one of the primary predictions of one. It is one of a very secondary prediction of one. So the details of how the external field effect goes in on does the link. And it works far from the synergies of uh, rotation. The potential is not static. Things are going around each other. The orbits are not circular. So I'm not going to try and test any particular modified gravity mode. I'm just going to try and decide if we need, uh, if we see a, a Newtonian anomaly or not. Okay? Now the first thing, I, the first time I tried this was, uh, was about 12 years ago uh, with, uh, with, with the Parkos data. Uh, the, the arrows were much larger than what we have now with Gaia, but the nice thing about it, the bad and nice thing about it, was that this was a, a sort of um, um, anecdotal catalog. It wasn't, it wasn't intended to be a, a fair sample of, of the solar neighborhood, but the, uh, the, the stars that ended up in the catalog were chosen individually by hand. Okay? And that has obviously its drawbacks, but it also has an advantage in that there was a, bin a light binary sample, a sample of uh, white binaries that were known to be isolated and bound. Okay? So, uh, so that was an interesting thing. Okay, so these are uh, distributions of delta V against uh, separation in the sky, exactly what is going to remain calculated. The red line are the, uh, the Newtonian expectations of, uh, of, of, of Scott and Tremaine, of uh, Yang and Tremaine, and the points are the data. So the upper end of the group's black rather than uh, increasing here. Uh, at the Jacobi radius of the problem, there doesn't seem to be a clear break, which was also a feature in the uh, simulations. So, it looks like, uh, like, like things are, are not doing exactly what, uh, what Newton said they should be doing. In fact, when you calculate the fraction of systems which are consistent with the Newtonian prediction as a function of separation, a fraction is one for the tight uh, binaries, but quickly across to zero as you cross or as you approach uh, the, A0, the A0 scale, which we know more or less where it's going to be. So this is the prediction of the angle remain, and these are the, uh, the partners uh, results. Okay? They are sort of consistent with Newton and then the arrows in this region. Although, of course, the other parts are very large because the, um, the, the, the precision of the data here was not, was not very good. Okay? Now, uh, when the first guy catalog came out, it had this advantage that, that you could link directly to the Parcos catalog. So, the Parcos sources could be looked up in the Gaia catalog. Okay? So, that's what I did here. I left the same uh, high quality, highly isolated uh, bound systems in, in the particles, but I updated <coughs> the uh, photometry for the, the uh, parallaxes and the uh, proportions to use Gaia data. Okay? And this was interesting. Obviously, uh, these are uh, proportions and parallaxes from Gaia and from the particles. I, uh, I kept only things which were consistent in both capital. Okay. So this is interesting because it gives me a 10-year baseline. So I'm comparing what was what, what the particles observed to what Gaia observed. And I'm only keeping systems where both satellites observe the same thing. Okay? That gives me a 10 uh, a 10 year baseline, which allows to eliminate a number of our problems and so on. Okay, uh, and the results here were, were this that I showed here, again consistent with this. Uh, but of course the, the error bars are getting smaller, but they're still very large. The sample field is very close, very, very small. Okay. So now, now we've got Gaia number three. Uh, we have a sort of first sample, and we start. We can start calculating uh, catalogs, large catalogs. So, what I did, and, and here the details are important because uh, the first point you have to worry about is how to select your sample. Okay. So, um, keeping everything that is within two hundred parsecs, so it's fairly close. Signal to noise in uh, parallax at least 100. Okay? This essentially defines your, uh, your binary. The distance along the line of sight uh, is consistent with twice the uh, separation of the planet's sky to within 3 seconds. But of course, 3 seconds is very small because uh, the signal to noise is very tiny. Okay? Uh, and this gives me about 7 million binary candidates, binary systems. It's a lot. So then you do a very aggressive uh, degrouping. Basically, uh, you go through the whole sample of, of binaries and if there is uh, a single star that is a member of more than one binary candidate, you don't want to fidget about which is the true binary and which might not be. You get rid of them all. Okay? And you keep only binary systems where each star is a member only of one, uh, of 
one binary system. And this guarantees that uh, the binaries are, uh, are isolated to the five parsers. There's nothing, there's no other Gaia sources within five parsers of each of my, of each of my binaries. Okay? This puts us down to 97,000 binary candidates. Then we have a number of, um, of quality cups, which are also very important. <coughs> uh, basically, we are trying to uh, weed out a number of kinematic contaminants. First are unbound systems, just chance alignment. So we're not learning about gravity, we're learning about uh, statistics of stars and so on. Neighborhood. And then each of the binary might itself be a binary. Let's call that again Persian. We want to get rid as much as possible of all of those things. So first, we keep only stars where you know what the regular velocity is. So the Gaia satellite does not measure regular velocities for all of the systems, for all the, for all, for all the stars in the capital. Only a small subset of the, uh, stars have regular velocities. In order to have a regular velocity, there are several uh, conditions that have to be met. One of them is that um, the, the, observed, the star has been observed many times. Okay? Gaia scans the scan uh, the all the time many times. And you need to have many sweeps on the same star in order to have a regular velocity. Also, you need the simple star solution to be good, to be very good, and to have spectroscopy. That is the first thing for the star. So once you keep only stars with radial velocities, you are sure you have a good single star solution. Okay? And then and I get rid of anything with a relative velocity, the difference of the lamp from side charge to the full kilometers per second. Uh, this is, this is a, a quality cut in, in Gaia, quality criterion in Gaia. And uh, if you keep uh, everything below 1.2 in this rule parameter, then you're sure um, in a very good uh, uh, single stereo solution. Now, in, in the brown you see the one in the gray, you see the uh, original uh, 97,000 uh, binary candidates. Once you include <coughs> all these uh, quality cuts, you, you go to the, to the black. Okay? And you see, for example, that the width of the uh, main sequence has significantly reduced. That means you're getting real errors. The, the errors in your luminosity are in your magnitudes are much smaller once you've kept only things with radio velocity than when you kept things without radio velocity. Large errors in magnitude mean large errors in luminosity. And uh, if you are inferring masses through luminosities, that translates into an error in the mass. Okay? So once you keep only things with radio velocities, you are sure your errors in the velocity are very small. And also, if you look at each and every one of the stars you're going to use in the nature di diagram, you can spot photometric binaries. You can read on the photometric binaries. Then there's been uh, a lot of studies from part of the Gaia group, Wynne Evans, Kathy uh, Clark, and Vasily Rov, and so on, looking at what regions of the nature of diagram are more prone to hiding uh, hidden tertiaries or not. For example, if you have a large star, a large, very bright, three solar mass star, it is easy to hide a little 0.5 solar mass star next to it. it. It would be hard to spot. So you stay away from the brightest stars, you, you keep below, say, 1.5 solar masses, and then it is much harder to hide a small star next to it. As you go towards the dimmer stars, even here the, uh, the errors are large, even after all, all of this cuts. So you can see that the width of the main sequence is blowing up towards the faint one. You get rid of the faint one. You don't want errors. Okay? You want to have a clean sample so that you are learning about uh, gravity because you have accurate masses. Now, um, most, uh, mostly, uh, people doing this have been uh, inferring masses, including myself, through sort of uh, a luminosity mass correlation. Okay. Now, uh, very recently, uh, not even a year ago, with the uh, with diet of the three capital, we now have internally determined masses. They use spectroscopy as well. They are not just fixed to, to, uh, to the luminosity. And this fits to luminosity. And one finds in the literature um, are done through proxy bands because the, uh, the Gaia bands are not the, the bands in which the uh, isochrons are, are produced. In order to get these uh, this Gaia masses, they are now using all the, uh, all the bands, all the Gaia bands, plus spectroscopy, plus custom made isochrons for the Gaia masses. Okay? So now we have much more accurate uh, masses, mass inferences directly from Gaia, not for all stars. So what I'm showing here is a calculated mass for, uh, for, for the binaries in the sample through this formula, 
against the internally determined masses of the Gaia subtype. And you see there is no systematic up here, but there is a certain systematic down here. It's, a, a, it's of between 10 and 5 and 20 percent. Okay? So if you have a 10 to 20 percent systematic in your mass, you are going to be finding it very hard to decide whether you're looking at the quantum gravity or, or something else. You have to really know what the mass is doing. Okay, so what is the, we, we corrected this by essentially by just shifting this here. And now we know, uh, compared this, this formula to, to the accurate guy masses, that there is no further uh, remaining systematic in the masses. Okay, we have much more accurate masses than what we used to have. So I'm actually using the Gaia masses whenever they are available. So the Gaia masses for the cells and star is not available. I will capture it with this formula after having uh, to use this shift. Okay? Right. Uh, now, let's have the results. The numbers here are very important. I, I wish the other uh, authors would also, would also show them. So this is a sample. This is the kinematics, the relative velocity of the plane of the sky, and the separation for a sample within 125 parsecs of the sun. The signal-to-noise in the proper motion is 3,000. The mean values of the signal-to-noise is 3,400. Extremely precise values. Okay? The signal-to-noise in the parallax is, uh, is 800, 500, okay? 850, and so on. The final rule is 1.01. Extremely good um, signal stellar solutions for each and every one. Now, it's obviously important to know these numbers because how much you can discriminate between one gravity ocean and another depends on how much your data are. Now, uh, if you look at the high acceleration region, this one here, again, the, the, the blue line is the prediction of Young's remains uh, for the RMS, the wind RMS value of this quantity against this quantity. Uh, relative velocity of the planet of the sky against separation. And you, if you're, you, you see the, uh, the data now trace that prediction extremely carefully. Okay? Actually, if you notice very carefully, if you look very carefully, there is a slight offset. The data are a little bit low. Okay? The Yang and Tremaine prediction assumed one solar mass starts. The means total, so, so the, uh, the, the total mass of the binaries of Yang and Tremaine was two solar masses. I, have, I end up with a mean total mass of 1.56. If you divide 1.66 by 2 and you take the square root, you get exactly this little box. So I've been, heard, I've been hearing people at the conference saying, well, the, the Uruguay binary test is very, it's very interesting, but it's very messy. It's very messy if you don't do it carefully. If you do it carefully, you can have extremely accurate um, representation of, of the Newtonian region. And it is crucial that we can have a good uh, representation of the Newtonian region because it's the only way we can be sure that we're doing things right. This is the only point at which we can calibrate. And this is obviously exactly what, uh, what Q did. Or if you think what you want to or not did. You calibrate the Newtonian region, then you know you're doing things properly. Otherwise, you have no idea. Now, the low acceleration region. The low acceleration region is very interesting. Uh, on crossing 2000 AU, this is 2000 AU, uh, the thing becomes flat. It stops following the, uh, the Newtonian prediction and it becomes flat. Not only does it become flat, but the amplitude here is curiously consistent with the Tully Fisher extrapolation across 11 orders of magnitude. Okay. This is the, uh, the, uh, the, the baryonic Tully Fisher. No? The uh, velocity, uh, rotation velocity of a galaxy is given by 0 0.35 times the baryonic mass of the galaxy is 1 quarter. If you put here instead of 1.56, 1 times 10 to the 11, you'll take 200 kilometers a second. If instead of that you put the average mass of the galaxy of the, of the binaries, you get 0.39, which is exactly this value here. Okay? It might be an odd coincidence, but um, in any case it's interesting. So I think we are looking at, uh, at, at the, uh, at, 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 certainly, I don't know exactly what we're looking at, but certainly not in the Newtonian relation. That's for sure. Um, now, uh, this is, this is a, a, a further out sample. So a more distant sample, I don't want to talk about much about that. Now, another way we can convince ourselves that we've got the physics right is to look not just at the velocity versus separation plot, but at the mass versus velocity plot for each of these regions. And this is what I'm showing here. Okay? This is uh, the relative velocity of the plane of the sky against 
the total binary mass for the Newtonian region, okay, for the type binaries. You know, if you if you uh, if you do a linear regression set, you obtain that the uh, slope will say is 0.46 plus minus 13. It's perfectly consistent to the velocity scale with mass to the one time scale you expect me to. Okay? So I know that the sample is clean because I perfectly reproduce Newtonian uh, expectations for the Yang domain here, and because the mass velocity scaling is exactly the Newton says it should. Okay? If, if this sample were full of noise, kinematic noise, one way or another, I wouldn't get either of those two uh, distributions right. Now, uh, I have very few stars, and the, uh, and the dynamic range of mass is miserable, so obviously uh, it, it, it's a hard thing to try. But if you try to get the mass velocity scale in this region, you get something which is frightfully consistent or frightfully close to a quarter. The errors are very large. So I'm not going to say that, that this is evidence for a Newtonian scale here, but it certainly flattens. Okay? Not only does the, uh, the, the, the uh, velocity separation occur show a qualitative change, but, uh, but, but the mass velocity uh, scales also flatten. Now, uh, I'm going to compare with some of the other uh, things that people are doing. This is uh, a parameter that uh, I think was probably used by Einstein uh, yeah, uh, to, to take a look at this. We call it V tilde. It is the relative velocity of the in, in a certain uh, component in units of GA and total rest. Okay? So for circular orbits, the kind of gravity gives you one. And these are the distributions you expect. Okay? So the amount without external P uh, prediction of, 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 of interval in, in, in this plot is for a peaky thing here. And then the, uh, the Newtonian thing should look like, like a blue curve, and the uh, mod plus extra Q mod thing should look like a purple curve. They are extremely similar. You are going to need very, very, very high quality data with no contamination or anything to tell the, the purple line apart from the blue curve. But the feature that you see is that the uh, the, uh, the, the, the modified uh, curve uh, is a little to the right of the blue one here and a little to the right of the blue one there. Now, this is one of the uh, earlier examples by uh, uh, Vitorius and Sutherland, and you can see all this stuff out here. All this stuff is just noise. Okay? All this stuff is just noise. Unbound systems, uh, hidden tertiaries, etc. Now, this alerts to the fact that in this region, that in this interesting region, you also have a lot of so deciding into the blue and the purple in this, uh, having this kind of mix is going to be extremely different. Also, um, okay. Now, uh, this is the, uh, the, the distribution of this beta parameter for my high, uh, high acceleration in total region. It, it, it has absolutely no noise. Nothing below about 1.5. Just nothing. Okay? Because I was extremely careful. I ended up with a very small sample. But I don't have any any noise out here. That shows I have I don't have any noise in here either, which is consistent with the scale that we showed. Okay? And this is my uh, view of tilde distribution for uh, the, the low acceleration sample. Okay? So you see exactly uh, pretty much the, the, the expectations of, of internet calculations. The, uh, the low acceleration uh, curve it, it is shifted to the right a little. There is also this thing here, which is Real. And there is no noise beyond, essentially beyond two. There's nothing. So now, the low acceleration sample is red. The low acceleration sample is red. Uh, and here I'm comparing the high acceleration sample with Indra's prediction for the Newtonian uh, thing. Here I'm comparing my low acceleration sample with Indra's prediction of the uh, aqua prediction of the low acceleration scheme. That's uh, in this this here. Okay. And um, Finally, I want to highlight, uh, of course, I, I didn't know when I uh, made this presentation that, that, that Q was going to present his, uh, his, his, um, his results on Monday. But, uh, I mean, if, if you look at this present, uh, at this present uh, at data in this plane, you see it's very hard to distinguish between these two distributions. Whereas if you do something like this, uh, the, the, the difference is much more obvious. If you look at, um, for example, and here you cannot, you cannot point at AC of this plane. That's something that doesn't, it's not very nice. 
Uh, if you look at Q's representation of the data, it's an acceleration point. Okay? Exactly what it was doing for galaxies. And here you can point you can, you can point at AC over here. <coughs> and anyway, so what he showed is that the distribution of uh, if he cut he, 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 he's, he, he's not worried about the um, how cleaning the sample. Uh, he cleans the sample very carefully in terms of unbalanced systems, but he doesn't clean in terms of heavy tertiaries. He actually models them. Okay. So uh, he includes a sort of free parameter, which is the number of um, heavy tertiaries you have there, and he models that, and he fits that parameter. In the Newtonian region where you can calibrate them, okay, and where you know what should be going on. Okay? Um, so anyways, uh, just like I find an extremely clear inconsistency uh, with the Newtonian prediction with the low acceleration regime, Q uh, confirms an extremely clear inconsistency with, uh, you can see that in this standard, with the Newtonian prediction in the low acceleration regime. We've been looking at each other's data um, ever since he posted, we've been uh, corresponding on the email and so on. But just last night, just, just uh, Tuesday night, we, uh, we checked at what uh, separation bin he starts seeing uh, um, an inconsistency with the Newtonian prediction. And I can now confirm that uh, the first point where he sees an inconsistency with, uh, with the Newtonian prediction in terms of separation is exactly the first point where I see an inconsistency with the Newtonian uh, uh, prediction in my data. So uh, in, in many senses, these things are, are consistent with the model. And um, uh, well, let me just, uh, let me just uh, stress again that uh, that in order to do this kind of test, in order for it does not be necessary, one has to be extremely careful with how you clean it and how you select the sample for starters. Okay? I'll uh, leave my music uh, up there. Thank you. So, we shall have uh, questions. First of all, uh, although this field is, uh, has, has some controversy, I really would like to thank uh, Javier for proposing this uh, important test 10 years ago. And uh, this is really a great contribution to science uh, because uh, you, know, you propose an independent method. Uh, I, I have some uh, actually comments and questions about details. Okay, first of all, you used the flame, flame masses. Uh, can I, can we go back to the... I, I use flame masses when they are available. When they're not available, I use the, uh, the correct scaling. I, I use this scaling plus this uh, Yes, but... Uh, but uh, I end up with 60% 60 of my individual stars are flame masses. Okay. okay, first of all, uh, equation one is uh, known to be incorrect already. <laughs> I mean, for example, even 10 years ago, this uh, uh, mass magnitude relation has uh, inflection points. There are like, uh, if, you, if you plot a mass magnitude relation for a wide range, there are actually two, three inflection points. So actually, when Pitotis and Sutherland used that relation, that was incorrect. And then you, you are comparing incorrect relation with the proper, uh, of proper values, so it's natural. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's and, and uh, 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 if, if, you, if you consider uh, if proper... You that I'm, I'm taking care of the inflection like uh, a posterior. Uh, I mean, if you consider the, the mass magnitude relation uh, widely respect... Mass yeah, mass, mass magnitude relation widely respected by the astronomer community, such as uh, Mamajax, on the pickup and Mamajax uh, relation, then actually that agrees with the uh, flame masses. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, but... So you're, you're talking about the uh, mass... Uh, uh, the, the mass... Yeah, uh, mass, mass, at, magnitude mass magnitude at a given... You're using. Yeah, mass at a given magnitude. And one problem with the flame masses is that they provide masses only above half length. 
Yeah, but there are so many interesting white binaries. Uh, having mass is below half solar mass. So, uh, you know, it's, it's binary, so total mass can be one solar mass if two have a half solar masses. So, if you limit to these uh, fly masses, you are actually missing many interesting white binaries. And also, there is a problem with that. You know, the limit is 0 .5, 0 0.5, so, you know, at the limit, uh, you are not likely to trust the message because it's the like uh, edge. And then I, I had checked that, and uh, uh, actually, Mama Jack's mass magnitude relation is uh, very good, and it's widely respected by the astronomy community. And also, uh, for some uh, magnitude range, it has been tested against binaries. I mean, not white binaries, closed binaries, so masses are very accurate, and I have checked that that relation agrees with uh, Mama Jack's relation extremely well, at the same band, at the same band. So, actually, I, I, I asked, uh, for example, people like uh, Karim El-Badri, whether what, what he thinks about flame masses, and then he actually dis uh, discourages discourages using flame masses, but I have checked that flame masses overall okay. agree with the magic, so uh, that shouldn't be a big problem. And, uh, okay. 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 And, 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 yeah. Oh, and, and actually, I have another uh, another yeah. that yeah. they are talking about. No, no, it's the RMS because the, uh, the Yana domain prediction is for the RMS of the distribution. So, um, uh, so, so the, uh, the, the red and green are, are the RMS. And the RMS, uh, the red and green are the, uh, for declination and, uh, and right extension for promotion. <coughs> is it necessary to just use the RMS or? <laughs> Can you go back to the uh, Tremaine calculation and calculate that what that full distribution should be? Yeah, I mean, that's essentially what, uh, what for example, what you is doing. You is repeating this calculation. You is really keep projecting and calculating all this and using distribution of all this and so on. You can repeat it and then, and then you don't have to use the RMS. You can uh, use however many moments of the distribution you like and make a final comparison. You can compare the distribution of points, or you can compare the means or the means and the following moments, whatever. Uh, I didn't do that, so uh, if I want to compare against the uh, Yang's remain prediction, then I have to use the RMS. Okay, thank you very much. We thank again the speaker.